part of it, the greatest untold story, uh, Magic Leap. So hopefully we're going to learn a little bit more today about Magic Leap. And we're uh, please welcome to the stage the CEO and founder of Magic Leap. Uh, I just blanked. Uh, Roni uh, Abovitz. And uh, to, to grill him is Matt Hagman, the uh, Miami Program Director at uh, the Knight Foundation. Jean-Paul Bardet, also the Dean of Engineering at the University of Miami. Please welcome to the panel. Well, hello, good afternoon. This is, my name is Matt Hagman. Um, this is, I think it's fair to say, a pretty anticipated talk, as, uh, as there are few companies, start to think of any companies uh, in the world uh, that people want to know more about right now and know so little about than Magic Leap. Uh, and so it's a, it's a great honor and privilege to have Roni Abovitz, the founder of Magic Leap and the CEO of Magic Leap, here along with Jean-Marie Bardet, the Dean of the University of Miami School of Engineering, where Roni uh, is an alum. So uh, we want to cover a couple of areas in the 30 minutes that we've got. One, to talk about this new technology. Two, talk, of course, about Magic Leap. And three, talk about Miami's growth as a, as a center of innovation. But before doing any of that, of course, we want to get the latest on Magic Leap, and it was at the, um, at the beginning of this year, Roni authored a, a blog post talking about 2017 would be a really big year for Magic Leap. So as a starter, Roni, want to know where do things stand as Magic Leap marches towards shipment of its first product? Sure. Um, so there's a couple things I'll share, some things will still leave for future supplies. Um, Number one, we, we moved into our factory uh, to South Florida. We took over a big piece of Motorola's um, old campus. Uh, so our factory is built and up and running, and one of the production lines is active every day. I was actually just in it uh, wearing a full clean room bunny suit, which is kind of awesome spending time with the, with the team. Um, we are making uh, things that, if you saw it, looks like a shipping unit um, on almost all levels. Uh, is is something that you would be getting when you when you buy one, um, but there's still uh, think about like our mission control. We have to pass hardware, software, full operational readiness, uh, number of applications still in process. But um, everything looks like uh, if we were like at NASA and you were looking inside the big hangar, you'd see a rocket sitting on like on the launch pad, the doors starting to open, and like you know people fueling. And there's like the beginning of that. Um, we've also opened up our private access dev portal. Um, a lot of folks have applied to become developers. Um, basically, July, August, September, we're going to increase the amount of those people. We really want to make sure we're learning how to serve developers and creators properly first uh, before we continue to open the access. So, uh, but, but it's up and running and live, and we're uh, supporting all kinds of cool engines as well as our own uh, software development environment. So these things are happening. So I'll, I'll stand by what I wrote. 2017 is going to be really big. And for people in the audience who are actually interested, you mentioned reaching out to develop, beginning to engage in developers. How does that work? Do you right. find them? Do they find you? Uh, right now, a lot of folks are finding us. Um, but uh, I just, what, what Magic Leap is doing, we're thinking of our, of our first uh, outing into the world for creators. We have a broader definition of than developers. So a lot of artists and filmmakers and musicians are showing up at Magic Leap all the time out of their own volition. We have all kinds of brands and companies and you know kids in a garage uh, to more traditional developers who may be familiar with like Unity Unreal or C Sharp. So it's a mix and I think embracing wider creator community is really what we're all about. Um, I think we're building a computer completely for creativity and creative expression, which is less than what you would think about for a computer that just did spreadsheets. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, a whole different model. Um, and the idea that uh, if you're a creator and you sink your teeth into what we're building, um, a lot of ideas that you might have you want to express in film or in music or some other medium, it seems to be a really wonderful medium for that creative expression and sort of uh, give you something chewy on it. So uh, uh, I don't, that's, that's a good take on it. And the product, when we see what it looks like when it comes out, um, if you can sort of share what that would be, 
and how much something like that would cost. Right. So the, the category we're in, and I'm looking at how the marketplace is shaping up, uh, there's sort of virtual reality, I could say firmly we're not VR, and VR is sort of beginning to get defined quite well by you know, like the, the phone in front of your, your thing, like a cardboard or some other kind of headset that has like a cell phone type display that blocks out the world. Um, we're not that. And I think people are beginning to understand what VR is. Um, AR is really beginning to take hold with, um, you know, all the toolkits that are coming out for phones, like Pokemon style things on your phone. And I think the consumer and a lot of developers are associating AR with the phone. We're actually pretty happy with that. It kind of gives you a, it's like looking through the doorway at some future world um, through the door of your phone, but it really isn't experientially or technically uh, very similar to what we're doing. Um, I think what we're doing is a new class of computing. You can think of it as spatial and ambient, where it's contextually aware, uh, you could be hands-free, you're not holding up a phone looking through a video display. Uh, it's a totally different kind of experience. So I, we think of it as like we're using our digital light field um, to create a personal computer that has um, it's ambient and that it's like always around you, always understanding what you see it sees, what you hear it hears, where you are it is. So it's contextually aware, and that's a completely different way to think about computing design than a phone for VR or a phone for AR. So we're really happy those things are happening because they're kind of like gateways to begin to change thinking from like flat world. But Magic is really designed for the spatial ambient world we live in. Um, and you just, you don't live inside a screen, you don't look at a screen all day, you just live in this big spatial world of of people, and you're contextually aware. So we're trying to build a computer that really forced that computer to act like people act, and understand your world without you having to tell it all the time. So it's, we're pushing in a, in a really different, interesting direction. So, so when we say uh, VR, virtual reality, AR, augmented reality, so you actually call Magic Leap. I think if you're getting really technical, yeah. I think spatial computing or spatial ambient computing powered by a digital light field um, because uh, you know, uh, augmented reality is like the idea of looking through a video display, but it doesn't really deal with all the rest of the computing and sensing that's going on. We, we, we involve a lot of perception and sensing, sound field, we've got machine learning in our sensors. There's a whole awareness that really ties well into having a digital light field wafer that allows you to experience the world very naturally. So it's kind of a, we think we're creating a, a, an interesting new category. So, um, you know, mixed reality is a term, I think, for lack of a better word, a lot of people have jumped onto. Now it's being, like, commingled with, like, VR things are called mixed reality, um, and it feels slightly mixed up. So I, I, like, I like spatial computing with the digital light field. It's so much, um, uh, much more accurate relative to the kind of system we're building. And you said that you know, the, the rocket is on, is now, is, see it there, the doors are opening. Um, when it ultimately sort of wheels and is set on the launch pad, you could just speak to what will something like this cost for you know, everyone here in the audience to, to have? So uh, one thing I won't give you today, Matt, is I won't give you uh, pricing today. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we do output pricing, we want to be like, that's the price and that's that. Um, I will tell you it's being priced for affordability on, um, call it mass premium, uh, consumer-based uh, device, and there are a lot of things you buy that are more expensive than Magic Leap in that sort of mass consumer electronics uh, category, and there's some things that are less. So I think we're in the zone that if you're um, willing to pay for a premium mass consumer device, you'd be happy with us. Um, as, as a reference point, it's not a Kindle. Uh, it's not a Kindle kind of pricing, um, but uh, it's, it's also not um, unobtainable and not like upper atmosphere so I think a lot of people will be able to get their hands on it and we, we want you to either want it at the beginning or you'll be a future customer at some point so that's and cool. would also just there there's been news about raising another round for background Magic Leap has Magic Leap and Wired magazine called the, the hottest startup in the world uh, and in fact among startups Magic Leap can't think of another startup that's raised uh, as much money as Magic Leap raised one point four or Four billion dollars, uh, uh, and there's been new, there's been press reports about actually raising another round. If you can speak to speak to that as best you can. So I'll do two things for uh, any entrepreneur in the audience. Um, one thing to get used to is you never stop uh, being in the mode of talking to investors, uh, talking to investment bankers. 
Uh, my last company, we did that in the early days, you know, going public and even after going public, you never stop. So you're always in conversation with investors, you're always in conversation with bankers, and you're always um, looking uh, to see if there's a good fit. Uh, and it just never stops. So that, that's an endless thing. And it's, it's just an a ongoing process, almost like breathing. Um, even if you're profitable, even if you're generating um, a ton of revenue, there's still like expansion and scale and things you might want to consider. Uh, so Magically will always be in that mode of like wanting to hear from like you know positive long-term investors who like our space, um, and uh, you know we're we're also launch is not far away, and we're looking at you know what what does the world look like after launch, and um, through through what happens next. You know the, if you look at the formative stages of a startup, you launch, you go commercial, um, and then uh, there's all sorts of things to do like when we go outside the U.S. Uh, when you do Europe or China or, or you know like uh, India and Brazil, like all those things, you want to constantly talk to investors and know that you've got uh, more dry powder for that expansion if things are going well. But we'll be U.S. first, but definitely not U.S. only. So we, we want to constantly look at like if things are going well and if we're getting good feedback, how quickly can we scale and when? Um, and we're thinking of our first time out as learning how to swim. You know, you want to swim no faster than you should be. Um, and a good, good way to put our, our company to everyone's mind is we're like the kid going into the pool with the, with the floaties, yeah. learning how to swim carefully. But as soon as we're, like, we're feeling confident with developers and creators and consumers that all, all the engines are working well, we're just going to go faster and faster than even. And I think that's a good approach for any company. Now, just as a quick note here, so our timer here, is it? Uh, time has stopped. His time has stopped. So, and we'll just keep talking. So, <laughs> did you make that happen? I no, I don't. <laughs> <know. laughs> just oh. let me know when we're getting oh close to the end of our time. Oh, now we've now we now we have. That's probably what our project team feels yeah. like. We just lost ten minutes. <laughs> so, Dean, I want to turn to you because we're listening to this sort of this new world um, uh, with the UM School of Engineering. How do you approach education? when things like this are happening and change Well, first I'll have a disclaimer. I don't have any financial interest in the company, it's Rani's company. But I, I, I was fortunate to visit uh, the company um, and try the device, one of the prototypes. And I, I knew that it was a disruptive technology. But when I actually experienced it, I really validated that statement. It's really disruptive. And um, it's really what's disruptive is how the device interacts with you, with the brain. And that's actually a frontier in uh, science and engineering uh, to kind of better understand the brain. And one of these uh, techniques, technologies, is really a uh, breakthrough. And so uh, I, when I visited that company, Ronnie made me thought, I mean, it gave me some you know, some uh, deep, I uh, raised some big questions. How, as a research university, how, how a college of engineering could actually help run its technologies? Uh, maybe how can we provide the engineers to help run and swim faster? Um, and, and this is actually a very, I, I think, a very um, provoking dialogue. I think between Ronnie and I, and Ronnie has been raising a lot of very interesting questions. I think the, the major challenge is that we have now to create uh, programs so that we educate to innovate. Um, that our degree are such that they, um, the, the, our students, when they get their degree, they're just not after a job, getting a job, but they are here to create jobs for others. And that's really quite of a shift in the philosophy, I think, of uh, our College of Engineering. Sure. So, Educating uh, lifelong learners in a way. That's correct. And Rani and I have been talking about these micro-courses. Uh, Rani needs, Rani is uh, it's converging so many technologies. It's amazing. Our phone, our iPhone is a convergence of many, many technologies from the GPS to databases, internet, and so on. All these technologies have converged. Ronnie's uh, device is even a, a more convergent set of technologies. And every one of your, your departments in engineering yes. probably have engineers doing it right now. That's right. He, wow. he, can, he can hire from all over the, uh, the, 
the field of engineering. And so that creates a new challenge for us, educators and researchers. So it's great to have this partnership between industry and, and universities. Ronnie is, is challenging us, and, and he's giving us uh, a window to, to the future. I hope they become the Stanford of the South. Yeah. That we can that, all... That's... <laughs> Woo! <Yay! laughs> President Frank is right down here, so we all hope that the U.S. becomes the Stanford So no pressure on the dean, right? No, no, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> MIT of the South. That MIT of the South would do great. Uh, so, with, and by the way, I, in full disclosure, I have not seen the technology, so I don't have the benefit of the dean of having seen uh, uh, what you did, but we did a brainwave. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hear that? <laughs> so, so, talk about this future where, you know, we see all these different emerging technologies, the ones that, what you're bringing forward with magically, and all these other technologies that will grow through that an exponential rate. Our lives will be much different. Uh, five to ten years. Talk a little bit about what that potentially looks like and what actually your concerns are. Sure, so if I was any entrepreneur in the audience, um, if I was like me coming out of college right now, I would be paying a lot of attention to, like intense attention to um, AI, machine learning, deep learning, there's no doubt. I would be looking at photonics and sensing, all sorts of sensing in an incredible way. The world would be alive with sensors. Uh, there's no doubt that's happening. I would also find a inward ethical path, you know, because if you, if you do any of these things, you want to point in a direction that tries to better people, better yourself. Um, all these technologies, they're agnostic, they don't have ethics or morality. We have to put that into our tech and how we move that forward. Um, this is like one of those times in humanity where you can move down dangerous paths or we could do great things. We could amplify people or we could replace them. Um, everyone in the audience will be part of that decision-making process. You will be replaced by AI computing or you'll be amplified by that and you'll be much more empowered. So you pick a path where you're empowering people and you're trying to like unite and unify what's going on uh, with people or you're going to like just replace millions of people with a, this attack. And I don't think it's good enough anymore for engineers to say, I don't have to worry about the left side or the right side of the brain, I'm only one of them. Um, you know, engineer or scientist. You need to be both sides. Uh, there's no way you can innovate without being both sides, and you can't just say everything will be okay, we'll just throw it in the air. So I, I think ethics and morality come into a deep play in the next decade, and as, a, as an entrepreneur, you really need to think about that. And sort of, a, and you've talked about a people first ethic. Is that we're, we're completely people first. Everything we're building is about how to amplify you as an individual, not replace you. In fact, I think we're going to hopefully be an antidote to the vast amount of AI and machine learning that will probably, if I look at this room, could be half the jobs gone, you know, in 10 to 15 years, replaced by software and data centers. And not the job you think they'll be replaced. A lot of knowledge workers and, and software engineers will find themselves just completely gone because some algorithm just does your work. Uh, actually, the person like cooking waffles at Waffle House might be okay because actuation is not moving as fast as, as computation and GPU. Um, so I, I would definitely pay really close attention to that and have like an internal sense of ethics. And I think science and engineering needs to bind those things together much more than it did. You know, I sort of self did that, but um, uh, you have to think like, am I doing good for the local region? Am I doing good for the country I'm in and, and more globally uh, in what you're doing? You can't just think I'm just gonna make a lot of capital. Uh, I think those days where you don't worry about your impact is it's not, those days should be over. Good job. When launching Magically, and, and, and as many of you know in the audience, Roni previously uh, built a more than billion dollar company which he sold Maurice. with Maurice Perret Jr. Um, the, um, uh, but you chose to launch Magically here, and you've talked a lot about how you see uh, Miami uh, and South Florida uh, as increasingly its own right as a center of innovation, and certainly with a great promise going forward. Talk about your decision to do it here, which I'm sure your investors, including the likes of Google and Alibaba, you know, might have pushed back a little bit on. I'm guessing they did. Right. So I, I definitely see South Florida, Miami, as like a center of consistent with the dean and others. A it's a hemispherical pull. Uh, if you're in Latin America, the Caribbean, parts of Europe, parts of the Southeast United States, like this can become a hemispherical um, hub, and I think it is on some level. 
I, I early on I enjoyed the, the white space, and to be re really clear and blunt, I didn't know any better. Uh, you know, I, came, I was born in Cleveland, came here as a kid, and didn't realize I shouldn't start tech companies in South Florida. Um, but once you do, and you have like the lack of noise that you find sometimes in the West Coast and, and groupthink, uh, you have this ability to um, you know think clearly and freely and innovate, uh, maybe better than when you go to a place with a ton of people. Uh, the other thing is there are now really amazing things happening. Emerge Conference, what's going on in Wynwood Design District. Uh, Dean's definitely raising the bar uh, what's happening uh, in a diversity, and I, I think the president's doing it as well. So there's a lot of really great things. Also, other universities are all trying to raise the bar. So you, I, I think for the first time since growing up here, there's like not quite a critical mass, but almost of like it's a scene that's about to start to happen, like maybe Seattle just before it runs. Like there's something going on. And it's real. It's like when I started uh, Mako, it was like I felt like alone in a raft, uh, you know, by myself. And if I was starting it today, it wouldn't feel like that at all. There's definitely movement and energy, and it's cool, and it's like open-ended. Um, and I just met with the head of a major media company in Latin America, and he completely validated that, like, you know, they look at Miami, like we here look at Silicon Valley. Um, we need to start thinking, like, that's how lots of part of the world think about this place, and make it real. like. Give entrepreneurs the chance, get seed venture funds here, mix it up, try and fail. Um, and if we could, in terms of building your company here, how many employees do you have right now in South Florida? So, um, uh, thereabouts, Paul Park. Uh, so, so uh, Magic Big Overall is over a thousand people. Uh, I think we're just pushing over 800. Uh, 800 here. 800 South Florida. Now, in terms of building that sort of talent here, how did you do it? Uh, it's a combination of things, and I hope what we can do going forward is a little bit different. We have been bringing people in, super talented people, um, paying them really competitive salaries, and giving them lots of options from all over the world. So they're like setting roost here in South Florida, people from the West Coast and East Coast and Europe and everywhere, from Brazil. And so now we're bringing like a brain trust here that will at some point, you know, spin out their own startups. And, but I do hope like the universities start churning out um, top-notch engineers and innovators who want to stay here because a lot of the a lot of the really bright people they just take off they go to Boston they go to New York they go to San Francisco they don't think you could actually do anything here and hopefully they realize maybe they have a better shot because they can stand out they, 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 there's a thing called a plane where you can fly and have a meeting on Santa Road and come back and maybe we broke the back that you don't have to be 10 miles away from a fund in San Diego Road to get funded yeah and Miami needs its own needs its own capital infrastructure that's as cool as in the road, and they need to make it happen. So, if I may know, you have a very good point. I mean, you know, if you look all around the, the world, uh, there are no great eco innovation ecosystem without a comprehensive research university to support that ecosystem. So, if you look at Boston, MIT, uh, it's obviously the biotech. If you look at Palo Alto, Stanford, you can see the relationship between the innovation ecosystems and the uh, comprehensive research university or system of comprehensive research university. So it's 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 very important for us to support that innovation ecosystem. It's our duty as University of Miami to end, and and uh, I'm sure other universities are going to help us to make this innovation ecosystem rich. Uh, so we have all these innovators which are going to join forces and they're going to be either working for Ronnie or working for other companies. So I think. Well, now we have a symbiosis. We we live together, uh, and we are going to partner and prosper together. Yeah, yeah. So it's a great time to be in Miami. It really is. Think about an interesting opportunity in the ecosystem. We're building a platform that um, could serve millions of creators to build businesses to serve billions of people. And I would say it's a classic platform. Magic won't be the only company at ever doing what we're doing. We hope to be a leader in it. But um, there's an opportunity to be one of those millions. And maybe in, in, in those millions, like you're the next Snapchat, you're the next Facebook. The wars over phone and tablet and PC, they're not quite over, but they're largely over. The, the completely wild west is this new form of computing that's going to be coming out. And I think there's opportunities to create like thousands or hundreds of thousands of cool startups, some of whom will define the next few decades of, of computing and the economy. So don't look back, keep, look forward. Yeah. And will this new form of computing primarily be through eyewear? I think we need, like, our form, our form in doing, um, uh, call it spatial computing, is, is on you. Uh, it's meant to be light and with you uh, at some point all day, every day, you know, everywhere. But the idea of ambient spatial computing 
think about what's happening in different parts of the home and sensing um, is really not only in the form factor we're building. This entire ecosystem of hardware, software, services, data center work. Once you wrap your mind around like where computing's going, there's tons of cool opportunities. Again, most people are looking back, they go, how do I become Facebook? Um, those guys didn't look backwards, they were looking forwards and imagining the next 10 or 15 years. By the way, you need imagination. If you don't have imagination, probably don't be an entrepreneur. But if you have imagination, you need to build a story of what the world looks like and go make it happen. If I may just, uh, you know, I'm going to go to China 16 hours travel. Uh, it's dreadful. Uh, and so I can imagine if I had Ronnie's uh, device, I could actually, instead of seeing a little screen about that size, I could see an IMAX. I could be actually in the middle of a prairie or in Rockies. I don't need the space anymore. I could actually dream right here in a confined space and make my travel 16 hours just a while, a charm. So with that in mind, we have one minute left. So Roni, just walk us through one use case. I mean, the dean was doing that a little bit. I know you've talked about looking at a sweater and uh, with uh, the Magic Leap device being able to sort of buy it on the spot. What's the, walk us through what an experience. I think really cool is think about like being a mom or dad, um, you got kids running around your kitchen and living room and you've got no hands free, um, but like you have, you know, you've got your cooking show, you've got your, you know, your, your CNBC or BBC, whatever you're watching. Um, but you also have this like ability to sense where, where all your kids are, what's happening. I think of the incoming trajectory, you know, three-year-old about to touch that dangerous thing alert. Um, somebody calls you, you just look and say hi. You know, your, your grandmother like shows up in like, like something right out of a science fiction movie and looks at you by and smiles. Um, you say, can you go watch the kids for a second? She's like, sure. And the kids are like hanging out with grandma. Uh, there's a lot of really, really cool things like, about life. And one of the things we're trying to do is like solve a life problem. Like, what do you do in the kitchen? What do you do in breakfast? And how do normal people integrate like what seems like a science fiction future, like a Disney World's Fair kind of thing, but in your world? And it's, it's going to happen. It's going to come soon. Like, you know, we all have like a phone in our pocket. Uh, in Star Trek days, that was totally science fiction. Now we don't even blink an eye. So, um, uh, you know, we're trying to make science fiction the Well, we can't wait to see what comes next. Dean Maroney, thank you very much. Thank you, Ronnie and Jean-Paul and Matt uh, for wetting our appetites. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be back.